So today we're here with Mary Alice Haddad, who teaches uh, in a government department at Wesleyan University. And uh, Mary Alice is a political scientist, and her work over the last several years has taken her into issues surrounding climate change and sustainability and activism. So uh, I'm delighted to have this conversation with you today. We have a several thousand people watching us on video, uh, at least uh, so they say, and and two-thirds of the students are outside the U.S., uh, and so they're, they're tuning in to uh, issues uh, in uh, climate change and sustainability from a variety of perspectives, really from dozens and dozens of countries around the globe. All of, of the students enrolled in this course, I think, are really interested in learning more about global challenges uh, facing us in the next decade, but also some of the things we might be able to do uh, to um, deal with them successfully. So w welcome. Thanks for being part of this conversation. Thanks for having me. So maybe you could start off by just to saying a little bit about um, how you got interested in uh, issues of sustainability and activism and climate change. How, how did your work as a political scientist take you in that direction? Sure. I uh, began my work actually looking at civil, civil society and democratization issues, particularly in Japan and also elsewhere in Asia. And I noticed a pattern across the East Asian countries in which the environment was the first area where governments allowed citizens to organize. So I'm interested in how someone in political science uh, gets um, focused on climate change and sustainability. What was your path to these issues? I began my interest uh, in civic engagement uh -huh. and democratization. And I noticed that across East Asian countries, the environmental issues are the first place where citizens were allowed to organize, uh -huh. and in fact were successful in gaining sort of uh, concessions for the government and change. Uh, and so that was that sparked my interest, and also as probably everybody knows, the climate change issues and the pollution issues, particularly in China, right. but across East Asia, are uh, uh, globe-threatening, right. not just local problems. So I, I began my interest that direction, and I was particularly for my most recent research project, I was particularly interested in how citizens can make positive change, even under political contexts where that change is very difficult. Interesting. So tell us a little bit, just so that everybody has the same uh, terminology in mind. Like, what was, when you talk about civil society, what are you talking? What, what's the sector you're focused on? That's a great question. So I'm looking. I define it pretty broadly, and I'm mostly looking at sort of organized citizen activity uh -huh. that's not specifically part of the government, right? And not specifically part of a for-profit organization. Okay, so they're not companies, and they're not like policymakers in the government. They're Correct. In, in the, between those, or apart from those sectors. Right, and so it could be local grassroots groups that are just doing, you know. Know, let's clean up the park in our town yeah. all the way that are voluntarily organized and have no budget and have no formal organizations all the way up to Greenpeace or Nature Conservancy or those things and everything that's in between. So in your research do you find that these groups typically are motivated by some event that happens right in their town, like an oil spill or um, some other form of pollution that's discovered. Is it is it is it usually about an acute crisis or is it about something broader? That's a great question. I have sort of a branch of research that uh -huh. is looking directly at this NIMBY question, which is not in my backyard, which is often. Um, portrayed as a negative thing where everybody says, no, I don't want the dump in my backyard or I don't want the nuclear power plant in my backyard. Mm -hmm. But uh, actually a lot of the most important environmental movements started as local NIMBY problems. And so the things that are motivating people at a global level for large scale corporations or the big international NGOs are these bigger climate problems, mm -hmm. goals of, of CO2 output on, on a planetary basis. Right. But things that motivate people locally are things they feel locally. Yeah, yeah. So they notice that their kids are getting sick. Right. Or they notice that they can't breathe their air. Or they notice that they, uh, their clothing is dirtier after they hang it out to dry than it was when they put it out to dry. And um, those are the kinds of things that people can really get motivated about locally. And then that, that can spread. It's so interesting because... Uh, and. 
in one respect, you, you, you feel as a, you, one might feel as an individual that you're overwhelmed by this. Like, so the example of you find your clothes are getting dirty when you hang them out to dry, that's, that's a big issue, right? It's not just your backyard, obviously. It's, some, it's, it's broader than that. And yet people will, uh, will react in ways that begin to really make dynamic political change. Can, can, can you give us um, an example of a, of a grassroots organization that, um, that starts you know, by confronting a problem and, and, and actually gets something done? Right. Oh, there are just so many, right. you, you well, know? Maybe, I mean, there's so many. Yeah. So it's, uh, you can think about one of the organizations that is operating at kind of a meta level that I think is making a really, really big difference in China is an organization called the Institute for Policy and Environmental Affairs, IPE. Right. And he's headed up by a man named Ma Jun. And it started with a very simple concept, which is to take the... Uh, inspection, environmental inspection reports of the Chinese government that are on each facility that they inspect. Right. And that information is already public. Right. But like in the United States, you have to like have a PhD to go and find <laughs> the data. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so we put it on this website and you can just click and find what the pollution levels are. And the thing that's really in ingenious about it is that he's now working with big multinational organizations, multinational corporations, huh. who are interested in greening their supply chains. I see, so they want to use this rating system too? Or? That's right, huh. so you have an organization like Walmart, right. which has you know, tens of thousands of suppliers in China, right. and they can't go and inspect all these facilities, and especially not just the supplier, but the suppliers, suppliers, right, tier one and tier two right. supply chains. And so they are able to use his database to audit their supply chain, and then instead of a local factory that was making T-shirts or whatever they were making for Walmart, the government inspector used to come and say, you're dumping not mucky stuff in the water, right. you should not do that. And they say, oh, I'm so sorry, here's $5. <laughs> and the government would say, oh, okay, you paid your fine, so right. you're now in legal compliance. Uh, but they weren't in environmental compliance. Right. And now Walmart, you know, can send them, it can send a letter and say, look, you got to clean this up. We're going to help you do that. We're going to match you up with third-party NGOs that are going to help you come up with a good plan to fix mm -hmm. it. And so it's a way in which there's a uh, the NGO has created a platform, sort of a transparency-based platform, right. to create an incentive, a social and a mm -hmm. market incentive for these large corporations to put pressure on local local or local mm -hmm. factories, even in a context where the government is not doing enforcement very well. That's interesting. There were some talks at the Social Goods Summit, um, some from corporate officers, about these kinds of things where they, they were, trade associations were creating self-regulation, uh, sustainability officers at large corporations had made very dramatic innovations, not because the government was forcing them to, but because they thought in the long run it would be better for the company and better for the environment. Uh, the chief sustainability officer at, at IKEA gave a really impressive uh, talk about some, in, in the end you think common sense things they did to change the way they ship, to change the way the light bulbs are used, but, but you know, they, 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 no one had thought of them before. They had a sustainability officer who could save enormous amounts of energy for the company and also uh, reduce their uh, carbon footprint dramatically, uh, because it's such a big, such a big organization. Um, one of the things you hear, uh, maybe more in the United States than elsewhere, is that people have a hard time getting um, uh, active around climate change and other massive pollution issues uh, because they're so long term. I mean, I was just reading this neuroscientist who said, well, it's because of our brains, you know, that we, we, we want, we focus on things that we can deal with quickly. And the things that are really long term, we have this almost biological tendency to deny. We don't want to, because we, we don't know how to, we don't know how to cope with them. So uh, do you see these uh, as uh, inhi inhibitions on activism or inhibitions on action because these problems are so broad, they're not just backyard problems? I think that's definitely true. Um, it's one thing, one of the strongest findings of my research has been that you can give people a lot of information that makes sense in their brain, right. but it's very hard to care. Mm. Like it's, it's really, really hard to care about 350 
points per whatever, right? right? right. It's just, it's a number. Right. And so how do you care about the number? And one of the kind of surprising outcomes was that one of the most effective methods for getting people to care that came out of my interviews in uh -huh. East Asia was the arts. Interesting. So political scientists don't think about artists as, or uh, writers or filmmakers mm -hmm. as political actors. Right. Even though every discussion about environmental politics in the United States always starts with Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Oh, it's a true. book, that's true. right? Yeah. So it always starts with that. And why was that book important? It didn't actually give us any more numbers that we didn't know. Right. But it made people care. Yeah. And so there was a way when I was interviewing sort of a filmmaker in, in uh -huh. Beijing, and I said, well, why? Like, why is this effective? Yeah. Why is this effective? And she said, when you're looking at artists, when artists are talking about material, they use a narrative. Yeah. And they can make people feel and become emotionally connected to the material. So it's not just, it's not just a number in their brain. It's something in their heart. Yeah. So the, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about these interviews in, in your own research and how do you, how do you go about uh, finding the people you're going to interview? What, do you, what are you looking for? Because I think a lot of uh, students in this class are, um, you know, there'll, be, there'll be people who are professors at uh, different universities around the world and there'll be uh, middle school students and everybody in between. Um, and I think there'll be a lot of interest in actually how one does research about um, Po the politics of engaging sustainability issues? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and it's a kind of a multi-method way of trying to get these interviews. So what I try to do is get a really diverse range of people. I go in with a set of research questions that I want to test, and I want to try to find people who can help me confirm and or deny the right. things that I'm trying to find. And are you doing this in what part, what, in East Asia, but yes. in, in any particular part of the? Yeah, so the project that I just uh, did my field work for was on, uh, I studied in Japan because that's a mature democracy, mm -hmm. in Taiwan and South Korea because those are sort of new democracies, right. and in mainland China because it's mm -hmm. not a democracy. Right. And I was interested to try to see how the, all four places have very strong governments that have very close ties to business, mm -hmm. and they're all kind of advocacy hostile environments. They don't encourage yeah. advocacy NGOs to form and right. organize. So it was a good place to go and try to test both the question of how do people, how do citizens organize around mm -hmm. the environment and make positive change in difficult situations, and also how democracy might matter. Right. Uh, so. In all four places, I tried to get people from the government, people that were working in uh, NGOs, both international type NGOs and also local NGOs, uh, artists, as yeah. it turned out. So I tried to talk to visual artists or performance artists uh, in each of the countries. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to get some business people, uh, business associations that were either dealing or not dealing with environmental issues. So I tried to get as many uh, as many kind of angles on the question, and my interview techniques tend to be around central themes, but I'll ask very open-ended questions and then see where they take yeah. me. And did you get a sense uh, that there are certain kinds of stories that are most effective, or is it just the fact that it is a narrative, or did you have a sense that there are certain kinds of stories that really seem to grab the hearts of people? Um, I didn't get enough to say one thing or another on that. I was uh, shocked to find that I got the same, the sort of overall question that I would ask is, what's effective? Right. Here you are in, a, in an advocacy hostile environment, like what are the effective strategies that citizens can use to make change happen? Mm -hmm. And I thought I would get a really big variation between these countries, right. and I didn't. I got pretty much the same handful. Yeah. And one of the answers was related to the artists and the fact that you have to connect connect to people on a personal level and make them emotionally engaged. And that piece of the story was consistent across all interviews, mm -hmm. but I didn't get m more specific about this kind of narrative yeah. works or that kind of narrative works, but individual stories and individual things, but also creative. Like yeah. um, if you think about 
all the uh, the manga and stuff that comes out of Japan and people are looking at uh, at these kind of more uh, imaginary worlds in which pollution is not a problem or pollution is a terrible problem make people really care even even if it's not a this story of the child that's dying in China because of our consumption of IT products that's dumping heavy metals in their water. Like that can also make people care. So there are a lot of varieties of ways in which the stories can connect to individuals. Yeah. In in the uh, Social Good Summit, we had a uh, presentation, and we, I think we'll use this video in the class, by someone who organized uh, what they call the Water Tower Project, where they, um, in order to remind people of uh, that not everyone has access to clean water, they made art projects out of water towers on the top of buildings, which mm-hmm normally just disappear, you don't see them, and, and suddenly you, you become aware of water. And the, the idea was to become aware that how in many parts of the world water is such a precious resource and there are things we can do to help other people get access to clean water like we do. And, and that uh, creating a sustainable water supply in certain parts of the world would be a huge public health and economic development uh, achievement. Uh, yeah, there's actually an artist that I interviewed um, called Ichi Ikeda in uh-huh. Tokyo who's this fabulously creative man, and he was commissioned by the UN Uh um, to do an art installation around the issue of water, and he created these things called water boxes. So there are these cubes that are about Mm -hmm. this big, and it's 80 liters of water, which is what the WTO has determined is what a human being needs per day Uh for all their needs, to drink, to wash, to cook, all the things that they need. And to think, and then of course there are installations related to how, how many Leaders American uses, right. which is in excess of a thousand yep. plus. This was pro- also and then, part of the you know yeah. other parts of the of the world that get you know less than quarter of what they really need. And so, but he put he's got a whole variety of ways in which these water boxes are now being used in terms mm-hmm. of putting faces on them. So yeah. this is someone who has enough, filling them to different levels, mm-hmm. displaying them in different ways. And he also has a number of community art projects in which. Uh, that are organized. He's got one set that's gone on like three or four years now around a river. Mm -hmm. So it connects the people at the mouth of the river with the people at the source of the river to try to, and people from all classes Mm -hmm. to try to connect how everybody is connected to this water Mm -hmm. source. And it's, uh, it makes you really feel that the water is important and that it's valuable and that you should conserve it and take care of it and that it, and that it matters for everybody. Uh, one of the things uh, we, we've uh, talked about in this week's um, uh, lectures is the, the the way in which climate issues aff- and other pollution issues affect different people very differently, you know, and then some people are very vulnerable, uh, and some people can actually take steps to protect themselves. Um, and I wonder that how that works in politics, because, you know, to motivate somebody who's actually able to, I don't know, get the air purifiers and water purifiers and put the house on stilts is very different from motivating somebody whose life is really threatened immediately. Uh, at least that's what it seems. Is that the case? I mean, do you find that people find through these narratives they feel connected to people who, whose fate is quite different from their own? Or who? Uh, Yes, they, they can connect that way. And that is indeed one of the biggest challenges is that It is usually the privileged classes, Mm -hmm. whether you think of that inside a country or globally, that are able to consume at a level that's not sustainable and offload the costs of their consumption um, and shield themselves from those costs. Mm -hmm. And so it's the people with access to financial, intellectual, public, Mm -hmm. political resources that are in that position of kind of being able to ignore the problems, even though they're causing most of them, right. whereas the vulnerable populations feel it very intensely, and they don't, they don't need anybody else's narrative to motivate, like they are feeling right it there. every day. Yeah. And so they don't need help motivating, but they often don't have the political capital, social capital, intellectual capital to organize, right. uh, which is tricky. Uh, but some, one of the benefits of the environmental thing, uh, problems mm-hmm. is that it hits everybody, right, particularly right. air pollution. Yeah. Uh, so if you are the prime minister or premier of, of China, you go out your front door. You still have air pollution. You still right. have it. You breathe yeah, the same you still breathe air your own as everybody air. else. Yeah. So you might have yeah. you know, purifiers inside your, inside your house or whatever, but you, you 
go out. You can't avoid it. It's so a great there, equalizer. It's a, in some ways, it can do that. Yeah. So there, there are ways in which that's not the case. And certainly in the United States, we've been able to offload, offload yeah. in a lot of ways or, con- or concentrate it in certain ways. But um, trying to find ways to connect and make people realize the costs that other people are are enduring as a result of their own consumption patterns is one of the great challenges of environmental activism today, I think. Tell, tell us a little bit about the things your students do, because you teach courses in this area, and I know your uh, Wesleyan is famous for having lots of student activists and uh, and people concerned about environmental issues. Yeah. And so, ha- ha- are there some particularly in great projects that you've seen students do, or um, you know, I think it would be interesting for the the online students in this class to hear a little bit about what happens on campus and you know, around these yeah. issues. Well, uh, my students do great things, as I'm sure you've heard and know. And uh, so I teach a class on environmental politics. And in the, it's a seminar, so it's a small course. Mm-hmm. And in that class, each student has to take on and study a particular country. Right. It's often the case that they study a country where, where they're from. Mm-hmm. So they're native of whatever country they're right. studying, or they've been there, or some other connection. Uh-huh. So throughout the whole course, they have to study this one country and study the issues related to that country, conservation, pollution, what have you. Uh, But on top of that, so they're not just studying the issues at a kind of an intellectual level. They also need to do some environmental politics. So I make them do this in a variety of ways. Uh I make them go out into the community Uh and do it in the form of a participant observation. So it's up to them what they want to be participating and observing. So it could be a trail cleanup. I see. Okay. It could be a protest. Mm -hmm. It could be a public hearing. It could be a meeting. Whatever it is. And so they they just get out of the library and into the the public sphere. Get out of where of our classroom Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. try to make a connection between the theoretical concepts that we're talking about in Mm -hmm. class, the sort of factual things that you've Mm -hmm. been studying about your country, Mm -hmm. and the place where you live. Because it's easy in this yeah. ivory tower to yeah. think that the problems that we're talking about are far away, right. but uh, they're right here. Yep. They're in Middletown, Connecticut. Yeah. They're in they're in Connecticut. So that's one of the things I do. And we also had an on uh, a social media related uh-huh. uh, activist project right here on campus. Uh, partnership with uh, it was a partnership with Jewelbug dot mm-hmm. com, which is a new app company. Yeah, and. Uh, that worked great, motivated a lot of students to join teams, and they got credit for everyday sustainable actions. 